Hello and welcome to a webinar of OpenES. So today uh, we are launching a new series of webinars that haven't been there before. We are going to let our users of our community report from their current progress in their current and past um, uh, uh, work with OpenDS. And today Paul Jakob Höbner from the Technical University of Berlin is going to start uh, to talk about um, different ways of route finding um, using OpenDS. Um, the topic of his talk is spatial learning with navigation system using OpenDS. The talk is about uh, to go one hour. After that you can ask questions directly to him by typing them into your chat window. And uh, during the talk there will be uh, several pauses uh, during the, the several chapters where you could also place uh, questions uh, to Paul. Um, there will be more in the near future, so if you like to contribute uh, as well um, by uh, presenting uh, your current status uh, of your work, uh, feel free to uh, um, uh, address us uh, for um, scheduling of uh, your webinar date. For now, I wish you a lot of fun and joy with uh, Jakob, uh, Paul Jakob's uh, webinar. I would like to hand over to you if, if you are ready. Yes, I'm ready. Okay, then here you are. Okay, so welcome to the webinar. Um, Mr. Mart already uh, told the topic. It's about spatial learning with a navigation system using OpenDS. Um, I didn't make any webinars before, so if I make any stupid beginner mistakes, please bear with me. And um, also, as you can probably hear, English is not my mother tongue. I'll give my best, but if you have understanding problems, feel free to just ask, even in between via Skype, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, just in the beginning, I wanted to introduce the project, project members in this. Um, case, of course, the Technical University of Berlin, who is the financial supporter of the project, um, the Department of Biological Psychology and Neuroergonomics, which is the department where I'm graduating right now um, with my master thesis, and Professor Klaus Gramann, who is the initiator of the project and the director of the Department of Biological Psychology and Neuro Neuroergonomics. Maybe as a little background about me, might be interesting to know, I graduated in media design in 2008, a subject which actually does not have to do so much with what I'm doing right now. After that, I, uh, after that while media design studying, or while media design studying, yes, I got in touch with uh, coding programming the first time, did a little bit on, on a rather unprofessional level, but I got closer over the years. and. Um, then I worked as a web conceptor and app conceptor in several agencies in Germany and Austria and decided to study human factors again in the year 2010 um, as the subject really interested me and it was kind of a good addition to what I did before. So the media design studies were very good supplemented by human factors. For the ones of you who don't know what human factors is, it's um, a mixture of psychology and engineering and not as you might, might think, these two things go very well together. Um, it's about designing, developing human-machine interfaces or interface between humans and machines with the focus on the human factor being, for example, ergonomics, psychology, neurology, everything which makes up the human factor within the human-machine interaction. And there I'm writing my master thesis right now. This is what the topic is about. Maybe also important, good for you to know I'm not a really trained developer so everything I will show you later um, everything I did within the um, OpenDS I developed within OpenDS is basically possible without even being a de trained developer I think if you learn a little bit about Java um, most of the things can be easily done okay so today's topic as I said before is spatial learning without na with navigation systems using OpenDS I split the topic into four segments. First will be just a short theoretical foundation or background to know what the topic is about. I think it's maybe interesting 
to see how specific ideas can be addressed with um, OpenDS. Then, of course, the um, requirements, the technical requirements, and the following development we had in OpenDS. Then, oh, maybe the most interesting parts are show you the experimental setup and uh, a short demo of the um, of the driving simulator and the laboratory we have here. And in the end, we'll have time for a discussion. Um, yeah, that's basically it. All in all, it's going to be one hour. Um, or maybe a little bit more of um, presenting and the rest we can just uh, discuss. Also, if you have questions in between, feel free to ask questions in between. I'll always try to keep an eye on the chat, so if there's anything, I'll try to answer. Okay, the theoretical funda foundation is based on the fact that automation of everyday tasks is today pretty ubiquitous, meaning uh, that with smartphones, cars, everything you use in your daily life is kind of automated, mostly even in a high way, highly automated. And as opposed to earlier days where only in industry there was um, automation um, which very widely spread, is, um, today it's very much in the private lives. And this of course has advantages and disadvantages both. Um, the advantages are pretty obvious. Things like precision, higher precision with automation, uh, effectiveness and efficiency can increase with automation. This is also for um, the end user. And of course, security is a very big factor that can increase with um, automation. Disadvantages, and of course, there's many more um, advantages. And downsides or disadvantages are, for example, the loss of control of the actual original task. So, the only thing I can do as an operator of a machine is react in a way the machine lets me react. And I don't have any information about the original task most of the times, but only the information the machine gives me. Um, we're developing a dependence on this dependence on the systems by using them every day and by integrating them in our society so that there's no way turning back. And also, and this is kind of the core part of this um, uh, presentation today, there is a long-term decline of capabilities by excessive use of automation. Of course, there's many more downsides and disadvantages, but today we'll focus on the long-term decline of capabilities and in specific on the decline of spatial capabilities by excessive use of navigation systems. Um, the term use it or lose it, some of you might have heard it before, um, doesn't only apply to standard muscles of the body, but also to the brain. You can actually think of the brain or certain brain structures as a muscle. Um, so if you don't train them, they will actually lose capabilities, they will lose power. Um, in the case of the um, spatial navigation or spatial orientation, um, the part of the brain who loses power or um, is reducted by um, excessively relying on navigation automation is uh, the structure called hippocampus. Some of you might have heard of it before. It's a structure which is, and that is the bad thing about it, you could say, is not only responsible for um, orientation or for um, spatial navigation or spatial capabilities. Um, the hippocampus is mainly trained by spatial capabilities, but is fundamental for many higher cognitive functions. Like I said, orientation, but also, for example, memory. Every new memory which is made must pass the hippocampus. It's kind of the tool which makes long memories last. Also, em emotions are connected to the hippocampus, and many more functions are linked in some way or the other to the hippocampus. So, this makes the problem very, um, um, very, very big, you could say because uh, the use of um, excessive use of navigation systems does actually affect the structure of the brain, which again does affect very much higher um, uh, cognitive functions. And as if this wouldn't be enough, there's another interaction with the demographic change. Um, demographic change and automation both are phenomena appearing today and uh, while demographic change has a co as a consequence increasing dementia, just by the higher amount of older people, um, automation um, leads to the same problem by neglecting cognitive capabilities, neglecting the training of cognitive capabilities and 
what you see here is what happens on the long term while increased dementia is a pathological loss of cognitive spatial capabilities. That's actually one of the first capabilities that you lose when you're getting dementia or Alzheimer. That's the cognitive spatial capabilities. Um, on the other side, there is automation, which leads to training-related loss of cognitive spatial capabilities. And if you put automation and demographic change together, you'll see that's kind of an explosive mix. That's also why the, um, this topic is kind of well-known or well-researched. Um, at least the single topics, demographic change and automation and the problems arising from it. But unfortunately, there seems to be a consensus in the relevant literature about um, the spatial learning and um, short-term advantages of highly automated navigation. So the consensus is that basically in a simple way said, the better the navigation system is, and that's like the core target of uh, economic and um, industry to make them better. The better a navigation system is, the less we learn about our, our environment, the less we have to think, so the more decline of our spatial cognitive capabilities. And this trade-off basically says that there's nothing we can do if we want to use highly automated navigation systems. This is the, part, the point where um, we in our department said there must be a way to go around this trade-off and uh, there must be some kind of potential to the excessive use, actually. So it's actually quite uh, obvious, if you think about it um, um, closer, that the advantages of highly automated navigation, of course, do lead to a very excessive use of the navigation systems. This excessive use does have a, pose a, a certain potential of everyday training through the everyday use. And if it's little training units or little, a little training in everyday use, this can lead to um, enhanced, enhanced training of spatial capabilities in the long term. So the key word here really is, and um, that's about the last thing I'm actually allowed to say about the system, about details of the system that we're implementing because I'm on a non-disclosure agreement about the very details of, uh, of the system we are implementing, but the key word here really is implicit training. So um, what we do is we don't develop a navigation system that the user uses and the user trains with um, consciously, like being in a training mode or the navigation system asking questions or something. We want the navigation system for the user to appear just like a normal navigation system, but to make the user learn about the environment without the user actually knowing. So that's implicit training or implicit learning. This is the only way actually to um, keep the attention on the original navigation task and still learn. So in the way of the trade-off to say, we do have optimal um, automation of navigation, but on the other hand, we still learn something. And on the other hand, it's the only way to allow the optimal use of automation advantages. This is just for you to um, maybe visualize the um, trade-off I talked about before. That's the current state of, the, um, of, of literature, of relevant literature, is that the higher the advantages, the less training of spatial capabilities and the other way around. The more training of spatial capabilities, the less advantages. You could think of using a paper map, for example, being very, um, putting much effort in reading it, rotating it, turning it around, trying to locate objects you locate in reality. All this working with environment makes a very precise picture of it. When this goes away, you don't learn anything about it. Now, the idea of us is to increase training of spatial capabilities and keep the advantages on the same level, or maybe even improve them. So you can see, in our case, we're trying to take an navigation system with optimal automation. Um, we will come to that later, how we um, implemented it with optimal um, automation. So being a navigation system that normally you would think has very few training um, um, capabilities, uh, doesn't train the capa spatial capabilities very well. And we try to increase it on this level. Okay, so that's so much to the theoretical foundation. Um, I'll, ask if there's any questions for this now and I'll just wait for 
I don't know, 20 seconds maybe. If someone has a question, maybe just post it as a, as a um, chat. And otherwise, I'll just continue with the developments we made in OpenDS. I need a chance to listen to drink. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be any question, questions up to now. So I'll continue with the developments we made in OpenDS. <coughs> There's basically three parts that were um, like three core functionalities or problems we needed to solve. That was First of all, a very large city model we needed. Since we're trying to um, learn about um, uh, training of spatial capabilities in large-scale environments, we needed to have large-scale virtual environments. And it needed to be virtual to have a controlled environment to actually be able to measure even small effects in the results so that there's no distraction from um, uncontrollable variables. Um, then there was the navigation system itself, of course, the development of the navigation system and the integration in OpenDS. And then there was a very important part, um, the, standard, the standardization, um, which we urgently needed to make sure that the small effects we were actually thinking, if they were there and if we want to measure them, if we want to measure these small effects, then we need to reduce the um, variance that we can't control, like through uncontrollable um, influences in the laboratory or even through the simulator as much as possible. So um, let's start with the city model, the large-scale city model. Um, some, I think the background of most of you is pretty different. That's what I was told in, in the beginning. Um, some of you might be developers knowing OpenDS. Some of you might just getting started, might just get started. Um, developing city models with OpenDS is actually, there's a very smart, very nice tool for this called City Engine. It's, um, you can create huge cities with it actually, basically, if you have a fast computer within minutes if you want. Um, so this is, gives you the basic structure of buildings, streets and everything, and um, textures and stuff like this. But still, of course, this is nothing which will work perfectly just in any animation or a 3D game engine like the JMonkey game, game engine, which is the foundation of the OpenDS simulator. You need to put a lot of effort, um, at least it was at that time. I think maybe there's been some improvements from um, OpenDS with an import tool. But um, at that time when we started here, there needed to be a lot of optimization within Blender. Um, um, going to uh, to optimize the model so that the huge city model, we will see a model on the next slide, um, the huge city model could actually be loaded and the frame rate wouldn't drop to zero. So um, uh, optimizations were of course reducing shapes to a rather simple shape and trying to optimize textures, um, all of this and this with uh, I think a few thousand of buildings needed of course to be scripted and there's a ton of scripts we wrote in Python for Blender, which is an open source 3D program, um, to optimize that. And finally, we made it so it was actually running within uh, um, the OpenDS simulator. Uh, but still, we needed to add a lot of details. That's a step which is really just manual handwork because um, City Engine, of course, doesn't really uh, build a city where all the street rules apply to logical street rules. So there might be crossings where there's errors on uh, errors on the street pointing to the left, but there's no street on the left. Or uh, maybe there's a stop sign or a one-way um, line on all the streets from going from one crossing. So some of them just don't make sense. So you need to go in there and adapt all this and change things. Some of them you can script. Some of them then you really have to make manually. And then the last step, integrating the whole model in OpenDS, basically meaning with the performance and the quality improvements we made in the optimization in Blender, then doing the step and setting, um, setting up the interactions and the logic, such as traffic lights, speed limits, um, stop, stop uh, points, everything which must be tracked and traced in data recording, 
and which is some kind of interactive and needs to follow some kind of logic within the OpenDS simulator. So the city model we hang on. the city model we developed. This is a, um, a picture of the street map. <clears throat> you can see there's a um, distance bar down there showing one kilometer. This is a pretty big city model. If you go from one point to the other, and you stick to the traffic rules, so you're not speeding and you stop at traffic lights and everything. It will take you probably a good five to ten minutes, depending on how the traffic lights are set. And if you actually simulate traffic in the city, it will probably take you much longer because it doesn't have traffic. But with traffic, of course, you have to um, take care of other traffic participants. This would definitely take longer. And in this environment, um, we were actually able, we were having enough space to actually check if learning within large-scale environments does work with our idea. Um, yeah, they, I don't know, I think maybe OpenES will actually um, supply this city model um, once they tested it. Um, uh, it's definitely a city model, I think one of the larger ones of OpenDS. And uh, it's really interesting to see how people in a large environment like this actually cope with spatial learning. So that's one of the greatest advantages of the city model, I would say. The navigation system itself is actually pretty simple. So we followed the idea of the trade-off you've seen before to say, to test our idea, of course, we need to have a navigation system that is in some way ideal, maybe even utopic, like something that will maybe only exist in a few years in the future because it's um, uh, so advanced in techno technology. Of course, in simulation, like we have here, you can easily just play around with um, ideal ideas. So we checked around the relevant literature and we found some um, some uh, research about um, future navigation systems and navigation system and, and efficiency and um, navigation systems that don't use too much mental workload, which is exactly what we wanted. And most of them were kind of augmented. So um, the technology you maybe heard about it um, of augmenting navigation onto the windshield of a car is pro actually what we implemented in our virtual environment here. And what we wanted to achieve with this, it's a very important point actually, is that the navigation system would have to be so good that the user wouldn't have to think at all about the environment. Because if you build a navigation system where it's maybe not clear where to go now, which direction or which turn to take, the user would have to start to think about the environment and just from that having a learning effect. And that we didn't want to have. So our navigation system would have to be so foolproof, a total drunk idiot will have to find a way. So um, you will see later how we solved this. We solved it basically with augmenting the information into, um, into the virtual environment. Um, of course, we had visual information and uh, auditory information. Being multimodal is known to be um, uh, reducing mental workload in, in many um, human-machine interactions. And um, for that, we needed to do some adaptions, smaller things like uh, enabling um, uh, objects to be loaded with an OpenDS that actually have a transparency because we augmenting the objects, they needed to be transparent, otherwise they would block the site. Um, then we uh, added auditory um, uh, announcements as well. And for these announcements, for our specific case, it was very important to be able to actually change the announcements rather frequently, almost for every experimental run, like for every subject. So we implemented a text-to-speech system, sorry, a text-to-speech system which actually uses the Google text-to-speech system, which is the best um, text-to-speech system from the speech quality up to now that has a Java API. And we implemented that. Um, played around with it a bit, so made it possible to even translate long sentences by splitting them up in single auditory files. And with this, it's very easy now to actually change the navigation um, announcements, the auditory navigation announcements, within a few seconds. 
um, we actually also build a tool to change this automation um, at, um, this uh, navigation at announcements so that people who can't code, who don't know XML, can just start the tool and change the navigation among, um, announcements for the, for the um, single experiments. The whole navigation system is trigger-based. So that is one thing that OpenDS does come along with. It's um, based on the collision of invisible triggers, of the collision of the car with invi invisible triggers. And this makes it not very dynamic. And, of course, to program a complete navigation system would have probably just been too much effort. So um, we made a trigger-based navigation system which just gives you the announcements when hitting a trigger in front of a crossing, for example. Then it tells you to go right. Um, this has a big disadvantage that if the user does get lost, though the navigation system told him to take a turn, he doesn't, we need to find some kind of way to get him back because the navigation system won't be able to calculate that because it doesn't calculate. And uh, we needed some kind of error handling strategy there, which is not dynamic, but which can handle the dynamic errors a user can make. Like a user can take a wrong turn at every crossing, but making triggers at every crossing would be hundreds of triggers, which would be far too much for OpenDS. So we introduced a automatic drive back function, which basically doesn't do anything else than measure the distance to the given e line, and if the distance is greater than a value which can be set within the XML of OpenDS, if it's greater than, let's say, 20 meters, the car will automatically drive back on the same route it came, be set to the last point on the ideal line it was on. Um, this way, it's a highly standardized setback. The user doesn't have to turn around. The experimental supervisor doesn't have to get involved and tell him how to drive back. It's all automated and nothing um, it's really distracting from the actual task. We'll see that later in the, um, in the demonstration. And the last point, the experimental standardization. As I mentioned before, very important part to be able to measure even small effects. Um, since in this first step of this experimental setup, we don't expect to revolutionize the way automation works, but we're trying to take little steps one by one and try to find out where the effects actually are. Uh, important for this was that all tasks should be done in one position. So the um, subjects taking part, participating in the experiments, um, should be sitting in the driver's seat all the time and do all the tasks, all the measurements we were wanting to do within this driver's seat. This needed some changes, for example, for the surveys because it's very complicated to actually write with a pen within uh, the driver's seat. So we took a tablet, attached it to the steering wheel, and now you can just type and do a service with a, with a tablet with a steering wheel. The sketch map can be, can be drawn directly next to the, um, to the driver's seat, but I think the most important part of this um, standardization was, um, and probably the most innovative too, is the reaction tasks we implemented. Maybe um, as an explanation, the reaction task we needed um, to implement was there to measure the time the reaction of the reaction a user would need to identify a crossing on a picture. So if he drove the route before with a navigation system, after that we wanted to check if he recognized the crossings that he passed to see if there's any spatial learning. And um, these crossings are presented in a still picture and the user can react with, for example, steering left for saying I took a left turn at this crossing, steering right for saying I was taking right turn at this crossing, hitting the gas pedal for saying I was going straight at this crossing, or hitting the brake for saying this crossing wasn't on my route. Um, this is just an um, um, example setup of the reaction task, but uh, basically the reaction task is nothing else than a PowerPoint XML, a, a PowerPoint file and an XML file. So um, you just put pictures of the crossing in a PowerPoint file, you drop the PowerPoint file in the same task as in the same folder as the reaction task, and it runs. So it's very easy and scalable, so even other people who write the master thesis, maybe after me, they can use it without actually getting involved into the code, but they can just change a PowerPoint presentation and that's enough. And it measures, of course, the time the user needs to react and also the user input. So any possible user input will be accepted as a, re as a um, reaction. 
from all the keys on the keyboards, but also, of course, everything from steering to turn signal to horn to uh, brake, gas pedal, everything can be at a reaction. Um, and a very, very important part as well were the PowerPoint instructions. Um, it's a very simple way to actually use them now. You just drop the PowerPoint instructions into a driving task, for example, and the PowerPoint will automatically be loaded before the driving task and the user can steer through the instructions by turning the steering wheel to the right, going to the next slide, or turning the steering wheel to the left by um, turning it, uh, going to the previous slide. So this was important for us to prevent that the user goes in and out of programs to read uh, um, instructions in, in PowerPoint, then to go back to OpenDS, to probably restart OpenDS, um, to restart PowerPoint, load the right PowerPoint presentation, and all stuff like this, because this is possible um, variables that are uh, um, influencing variables that actually influence the results and might be um, giving too much variance to actually measure any effects of the effects we want. Um, editing, as I said before, on the reaction task is very easy just in PowerPoint and of course the control is, like I said, very intuitive just with the steering wheel. Um, Another point which was important that we didn't want any interruption by the experimental supervisor. So um, we wanted to prevent that the supervisor says something in between like, okay, hang on, I'm loading the next task, or the supervisor ends the current task, clicks through the file browser, goes to the next task, because all of this is potential influence on the subject and might change the, um, the way the subject reacts. Um, the duration between the tasks, everything that's variables that we needed to exclude, that we needed to eliminate. So we introduced, uh, we implemented task batches, which is actually also a pretty simple idea. You just have an XML file and you list the tasks, be it driving tasks or reaction tasks, in any kind of order, and this task will be performed in a row, just one after another, without any interruption by the experimental supervisor necessary just to standardize, um, standardize this in a highly way. Um, yeah, you will see, we will see later how this, uh, how this works. I won't go into development details, how we developed it, unless someone really wants to know something about it, but um, I think the idea of it is probably enough. Maybe just a quick overview of the further developments we made were local restrictions. We had to adapt the software, of course, like probably everyone has to our laboratory um, requirements, like they, we don't have any gears, we don't have a CAN server in our um, simulator, so we needed to do this all over keys. The user must be able to drive reverse. He doesn't have a keyboard on the steering wheel, so we needed to bake built-in buttons on the steering wheel to be able to drive back. We integrated turn signals, turn signal sounds, um, a dashboard which is externally uh, addressed over TCP IP over the local network. So speed, rounds per minute, and gear is actually shown to the user on the dashboard. Um, we planned on keeping the whole thing very flexible, so we wanted that further developments, further experiments can adopt the software on an XML level, basically, basically without actually coding in OpenDS. So we, all the changes, most of the changes we made um, can, be, um, um, can be changed via XML. Um, we, for the model editing of the city, for example, we have a lot of scripts in Blender which enable the user, that's our vision, it's not as far now, um, but enable the user to build a model with City Engine, drop it into Blender, run a few scripts over it, export it for um, City Engine and have a large scale city model which actually works and has some of the most, um, um, like the, the parts of the project which are need most effort already done. Then we have immersiveness, a very important thing to actually have a simulation where the user feels he is in a really real environment, at least a little bit. For this, it was important for us to change, for example, the speed perception. Since the speed perception, as we found out, depends on various measures within the simulation, such as the distance of the car from the ground, um, the field of view of the camera, 
like is it maybe 35 degrees or 65 degrees, this changes the perception of the speed. Also the size of the beamer and the distance from the beamer, um, from the projection. So in order to be able to adopt this to a speed that the, actually, the user actually feels he's driving, we put a speed perception factor within the XML where you can actually now um, just change the factor and this changes the speed which is shown to the user on the dashboard so the user sees on the dashboard what he feels from the um, presentation. We changed the gas behavior from the gas pedal so uh, the speed of the car is now aligned to the position of the gas pedal and um, this is probably not for all important because, pro um, because the simulation of the, um, of the gears of the car is not as realistic now anymore. But uh, this helped us a lot for the subjects to be able to keep speed limits because um, there were some problems with driving exact speeds before because the car started to shifting up and down. Um, and as well there is the steering. Um, we didn't spend much money on the controls. We bought a $80 game controller from Logitech. Um, and he's got the, that one's got the big disadvantage that it's only rotatable by about uh, 110 degrees, which is about a fourth of norm, normal steering wheel. Um, this means that the steering of the car is very sensitive, like four times as sensitive as in a normal car. Uh, in slow speeds, this might be okay, like driving very slow. You get to use, the, use it very fast, but if you're driving fast, um, with a such sensitive wheel and you just touch it a little bit and turn it and you're going 100 kilometers an hour or something, you'll just go off the road and into the, in, into the bushes. It's very hard to control them when you're really fast. So we put a steering influence factor from the speed into the XML so you can say the faster I go, the less sensitive my steering should get. And last but not least, data recording. We added data recording for the turn signal. We're recording all the triggers that are hit. We're recording the speed zones in the text file, um, in, the, in the car TXT file. We're recording um, a subject backup. So after each project run, the whole subject, the driving uh, tasks and everything is copied into a backup file to be able to completely restore that in case you want to rerun the simulation in the exact same way. And um, of course, the off-route restriction, like leaving the predefined route for more than 20 meters is recorded, so you can say, ah, oh, the user got lost like two times or three times. And something maybe more comforting maybe, where we put in automation, uh, automatic subject IDs, so when you start the task, the um, system scans the analyzer folder where all the data is saved um, for subject IDs, takes the next subject ID in this way you're safe to not accidentally overwrite some folder or um, overwrite subject ID that already um, performed the experiment. Yeah, that's it for the development in OpenDS. If you have any questions now, um, please feel free to ask. Um, I'll be like the chapter before, I'll just be waiting for a few Minute, a few seconds, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And we'll continue in a few seconds with the experimental setting and the demo of the driving simulator. So I would like to use this uh, short break um, to have a remark on what you said uh, about sharing of your large-scale city model. Uh, we would be totally mm -hmm. proud if, you, if we could uh, um, share this, this with our community. So uh, if you allow us, uh, we will we'll, uh, yes. place this on our web page, of course. Yes, and um, I, I don't have any um, uh, objections against that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, fine with me. I'm glad if someone can reuse it. So um, there doesn't seem to be any questions up to now? We'll have yeah. time for more questions in the end. Anyway, was there anything else you wanted to say, um, um, Rafael? Yeah, I wanted to thank you uh, for these, these great uh, extensions uh, you presented in this uh, chapter. Um, it's a very elegant way to present PowerPoint slides instead of um, the, these instruction screens we used before. 
and about mm -hmm. all the others, uh, other extensions uh, you mentioned. It's, uh, it's a great work. Thank you very much and thank you for uh, making a free open driving simulator. <laughs> I think that's the least you can do to put something back in the project. So um, you're welcome. Um, okay, so let's continue with the experimental setting and the demo. Um, there's three parts I want to show you. That's first of all, the briefly look into the um, Blender city model. Um, within Blender to get an idea of how large it is and how it is constructed and set up. Then I'll just show you very quickly the laboratory, how we are set up here. Might be interesting for other people who want to make projects like this. And then we'll have a little test drive through the experiments. Um, I won't make it the complete experiment because the complete experiment lasts for about an hour. Um, I'll just um, take a shortcut from time to time, but I'll show you the basic functions that we implemented and that's probably one of the most interesting parts. Um, yeah, so let's get going. I'll just have to start Blender. Uh, here it already is. Um, this is a view from, uh, yeah, I don't know, probably a kilometer of height or something on the, on the city model. You can get an idea when you look at the streets that it's a pretty large um, city model. Like the streets you see down here, some of them have three or four lines and um, the buildings downtown, some of them are I would say at least 100, 150 meters tall. Um, so in this environment you can play around a lot with different routes, um, exploring the city. It's actually kind of fun. I mean I've been driving the city around a lot um, trying to figure out where there's traffic rule violations by wrong signs or something and correcting everything and um, it's really kind of fun to explore the city which was dynamically created by city engine on some random rules more or less. Um, for the setup of the model if, if you um, uh, will get it over OpenDS you can probably you will also um, have this structure here um, I'll change to this view. You can see uh, this is the wireframe view. There's, for example, a park in the city model as well. Um, there's uh, suburbs, um, the uh, um, downtown city area where there's skyscrapers, and of course, there is something very important um, we implemented because City Engine doesn't do that, is landmarks, for example. Uh, landmarks is everything that stands out a little from the standard city buildings. And especially for classic navigation, uh, for, for um, orientation, we need some points where we can orient on. If we don't have these points, it's getting really hard to orient. And since we wanted to have a realistic environment with these visual anchor points, um, we implemented these landmarks into the model. Um, then, of course, there's the uh, navigation uh, um, objects that we uh, navigation objects that we built into the um, the model. As you can see, we tried to make it make Blender kind of the map building tool. So we don't really use the XML as much as originally suggested by OpenS, but we kind of put everything together within Blender because this is a kind of uh, what you see is what you get experience and um, you just put everything in the right place and then you export it, it as a model and you just edit via XML without um, changing the, the coordinates or anything and um, it's there. So uh, this whole, this, this um, file of, open the, of the OpenDS map kind of contains everything you need. Um, also, there is, uh, beside landmarks, there's the traffic signs, then there's the speed signs, for example, then there's the um, traffic lights um, and triggers and waypoints, for example, for the, for the ideal line. Everything is made within here, and then we have a ton of scripts which have not been documented yet, unfortunately. Um, this is going to be a lot of work, but a ton of Python scripts where you can, for example, export the triggers. So you run the script 
and it just exports you all the triggers. It also creates the XML file for the for OpenDS. So you can just export the triggers and copy the XML file in the right place or copy the contents of the XML file and your triggers will be there in the right place. Of course, you still have to link them to activities, but um, some of the redundant work you do all the time when changing little things is taken over by scripts. Same with landmarks or the city model. Okay, so is there any questions regarding the city model in Blender? Um, if there are questions, uh, maybe it's just uh, smarter to say you just ask the questions anyway and I will um, um, answer them when I have time in between um, so we don't have to wait every time I ask if someone has a question. Um, okay, so let's go back to, oh no, yeah, now I'll show you the laboratory. I'll have to start my webcam for this. Uh, where is it? Here. Okay. Um, is it running? Yes, we can see you very well. Here it says it is running. Okay, perfect. So I'll just show you around the lab. I'll turn on the lights for a second so you can see more. Um, it's a very simple basic setup. We call it Zipskiste. Um, it's like seating box um, translated like the interior of an old car. As you maybe a little technical details for the um, for the for the geeks. Um, here's the uh, steering sensor or the um, uh, control of the of the steering from a game controller, and we attached it to the steering using a paint roller for the walls because this was just the ideal way to connect it, having some flexibility but also a very stable solution because people tend to really tear on the steering wheel and um, that needs to take a lot of power. Then we have the iPad, just a second, the iPad um, in, the, in the steering wheel like this. You can put it there when you fill in the um, questionnaires and put it back if you don't. And over there you can draw the sketch maps. Yeah, and that's basically it. Back here there is a little uh, supervisor computer where you can see exactly what the driver is doing. Now, okay, I have to, can I see my own pictures somehow? Um, trying to figure out. Sorry, I cannot help you there. We didn't use a webcam before. 